Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever it is that you are joining us from in the world. Um, here in uh, Oklahoma, it is four o'clock in the afternoon, and this is a great way to spend an afternoon. I'm Carrie White, your Zoom host for this week's events. I want to welcome you to the readings by the 2022 Newstat Prize jury. Our moderator for today's event is Daniel Simon, the Assistant Director and Editor-in-Chief of World Literature Today at the University of Oklahoma. But before I turn things over to Daniel, I have just a few quick announcements for those of you who have not been with us so far. I want to make sure you know how to engage with us well during the session. Throughout the entire Lit Fest, including today's session, we invite you to use the chat box to have conversation and dialogue with one another, with our panelists and authors. We want to make sure you know how to use the Zoom tools available to you. One of those being that you can control your own viewing options. There are times like now that I'll be pushing out some slides to you or making one of our presenters large on your screen so you can see them better, but you can always override any of that. Um, in the top of your um, screen, you should have a view options uh, that, where you can adjust your view, make things look how you want them to look, go back and forth between speaker view and gallery view, make the slides big or small, totally up to you. If you have questions for our authors, we are going to have some Q&A time at the end of the session, so please put those in the chat box. We ask that you start those questions with the word question in all caps. That'll let Daniel know that it is for one of our panelists and not for everybody else who is watching. And so he'll be able to see it and direct that question. And if it is for an individual author, if you would put who you are directing that toward, that would be great. You can use first name or last name. Um, except for Carlos, you'll need to use last name because we have two of those. Um, so make sure that Daniel knows who your question is for. Otherwise, the rest of us might be looking at your comment in the chat and start responding ourselves. If you need any technical help during the session, you can also use the chat box to get in touch with me, Carrie White, or Richard Feinberg, who is noted on your screen as a co-host. Another one of your Zoom tools is closed captioning. If you would like to turn this on, you can see a live auto transcription of the discussion. You should have gotten a notice when you joined that we are recording. If you would prefer not to have your image recorded, please turn your camera off. However, if you would, we would love to have your camera on because our authors love to see your smiling faces. It helps them know when you're laughing at their jokes and enjoying their readings. This also is our reminder that you can come back and watch this later or share it with others. Once the recordings are available, we will notify all registered participants where you can access those. It is the expectation of the Newstat family in the University of Oklahoma that all participants of the Newstat Lit Fest enjoy a welcoming and inclusive environment, free from all forms of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. So we thank you for engaging with us in a respectful manner. And then finally, I want to make sure you know how you can peruse our Lit Fest book list on the event website. The book list is linked to Bookshop, and it includes representative titles by this year's participating jurors, whom you're about to hear from, and our featured writers and this year's laureate. So um, be sure to take a look at the event website, click on that drop down menu, and you'll see access to the book list. And with that, I will pass things off to Daniel and our jurors. Thank you so much, Carrie, and welcome to this culminating event of day one of the 2021 New Stat Lit Fest. My name, again, is Daniel Simon. I'm the Editor-in-Chief and Assistant Director here at World Literature Today at the University of Oklahoma. So welcome again, and especially to our attendees from more than two dozen countries who are joining us um, today including Australia, India, South Africa, and Brazil. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful that we could do this on Zoom and um, invite so many of you to uh, participate and make this truly a, a global uh, literary festival. So we are going to spotlight the 10 writers who make up the jury for the 2022 Newstat International Prize for Literature today. Jennifer Croft, Tarpia Faizula, 
Hamida Ismailov, Fauzia Karimi, Eleni Kefala, Aro Kwan, Carlos Labe, Carlos Pintado, and Matthew Shinoda, as well as Olga Zilberborg. So they are part of uh, making literary history and here in this 51st year of the Neustadt uh, Prize, going back to 1970, more than 300 writers have taken part in this tradition of choosing who they think are some of the best writers in the world and championing their work for the Neustadt. And so today what we'd like to do is actually put the spotlight on the jurors themselves and their own work and uh, their esteemed uh, contributions to the international uh, literary landscape. So tomorrow morning, they will meet to deliberate and vote on the winner of the 2022 Neustadt International Prize for Literature, the results of which Kathy Neustadt will announce during a live Zoom event that starts at 7 p.m. Central Time. So to add a little drama in the run-up to their decision, we're going to open a viewer's poll now to ask the question, who do you think will win the Neustadt International Prize for Literature. I will announce the results of the poll at the end of our time together. Moreover, we will be giving away one signed book by each of the jurors. So verse collections by Carlos Pintado, Eleni, Matthew, and Tarfia, and prose texts by Carlos Labe, uh, Fauzia, Hamid, Jennifer, Olga, and R.O. To keep you in suspense, I will announce a winner as I introduce each writer. Time permitting, we can op open up the event to questions for the writers at the end. So if you do have a question for a specific writer, please put it in the chat with question for X in all caps at the beginning. So as I introduce each writer, I'll ask them to tell us the, their, the name of their nominee, uh, where they're logging in from, and, and maybe something about the excerpt they're going to read. So we'll start today with Jennifer Croft. She won the William Saroyan International Prize for Writing for her illustrated memoir, uh, Homesick, which is this book here, and the Man Booker International Prize for her translation from Polish of Nobel laureate Olga Tokarczuk's Flights. She is also the editor of Serpientes y Escaleras and Notes on Postcards, as well as numerous pieces in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Paris Review Daily, and the New York Review Daily, and elsewhere. Her other translations include Romina Paola's August, Federico Falco's A Perfect Cemetery, Pedro Mayral's The Woman from Uruguay, and Olga Tokarczyk's The Books of Jacob. She holds a PhD in Comparative Literary Studies from Northwestern University. And before I ask you to start, Jennifer, I'm going to read the name of the first recipient of the book giveaway, Nde Sene Mbai from Montreal, Quebec and I will keep announcing them as we work our way through the list. Jennifer. Hi, it's so wonderful to be here, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. And my nominee is uh, Bobakar Boris Diop, who is a really brilliant Senegalese writer, who writes in French and Wolof. Um, and today I'm gonna to be reading from my book, Homesick, that Daniel mentioned, um, just a, an excerpt from the very start of, of the book. Oh, and I'm, and I'm in Los Angeles. I was supposed to say where I am. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and then share my screen. Um, the book is illustrated with a number of images, all photographs that I took um, in color and black and white. I'm gonna share the color photos as I read. Even though she knows she's not supposed to, Amy looks forward to tornadoes. Even in the day, the sky gets black and the streets get empty. The wind pries back the leaves of the silver maple tree and underneath they gleam. When it's a tornado watch, they don't do it. But when it's a tornado warning, the girls go and get inside the pantry where they squeeze in among the cans and powders and cardboard boxes and wait until one of their parents says they can come out. The pantry is the only place in the whole house that does not have windows. You have to stay away from windows when a tornado comes because the very thing tornadoes love best is breaking glass. And if that happens and you're sitting, for example, in the bathtub right below the bathroom window, you will almost inevitably get hurt. 
When the sirens start, Amy gets them organized. She has developed a system. Each of them is allowed three toys, not more, and Amy is in charge of the flashlight because Zoe might break it. Zoe always dallies over her dolls, feeling guilty for playing favorites. But Amy explains to her how in life you have to make choices, and eventually Zoe always does, although sometimes she tries to hide things in her tiny pants pockets. When she gets caught, she bursts out laughing or into tears, depending on Amy's face. She always gets caught. Then Amy quiets Zoe and they kneel down on the dimpled linoleum, pull the door shut and wait. Once the door is closed, Zoe's dolls have conversations. Often they discuss the weather. Amy just listens, lets her own dolls rest, feels her sister's hot quick breaths on her neck. If their electricity isn't out, Amy insists the light be off anyway. Slowly, she gets sleepy like she does in the car. And just like when they drive somewhere, Amy, unlike Zoe, would rather just not get there, would rather just keep going, would like it if the warning never expired. Then the pantry door will fly wide open and all across the top of it, the frying pan and the strainer and all the knives will glint and shiver like they want to fall and their mother will reach down and grab Zoe, and then she'll carry her away. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. That was lovely. That was such an Oklahoma uh, experience of going into the hidey hole or into the, the pantry for a tornado warning, which we just had a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, here. So um, it's something I think many of us that are that are here in, in the Southern Plains can relate to. Okay, we'll move on to our second reader. I should note that um, <clears throat> for those of you who are getting, receiving the books, the signed books for the book giveaway, we have your email addresses so I, we can email you afterwards and follow up to get your mailing address for, for the book giveaway. So our second recipient will be Lori Culver from La Jolla, California. So now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Tarfia Faizula, who is the author of two poetry collections, Registers of Illuminated Villages and Scene, 2014. In 2016, Tarfia was recognized by the Harvard Law School as one of 50 women inspiring change. And she is a 2019 United States Artist Fellow and lives in Dallas, Texas. And this is Registers of Illuminated Villages, one of the books we'll be giving away today. And I think this is the source of her reading as well. Tarpia, welcome. Hi, thanks y'all. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. It's a joy to be here with y'all today. Uh, my nominee is Naomi Shihab Nye, and I'm actually not gonna be reading from registers. I'm gonna read a new piece and I'm gonna read it off my screen without my glasses, but hopefully we will prevail. Uh, I'm just gonna read one poem. It's a slightly longer poem. There was a window there was a window, those evenings after a day daring discipline, I'd stare at the window from my little landing across the way and the dogwood tree. My thoughts were a new species of firefly undiscovered as of yet. The window belonged to other occupants, but I didn't care who they were, i.e. it wasn't my window, i.e. economy and society, but I felt a kinship with it. The dogwood silhouette rescued the window from being a plain old pane of glass. A specific leaf would sway and a twilight at that. That leaf took on a worldly density as if inked, like a painting? No, a summons, as if the window was an oracle, an opening to a wild where we could be ourselves for a spell. Oof, the largeness of feeling window gave as I gazed at her from my still little life, the glossy blackness of her leaf window. She was me, her branch, her tree, wind, light rain, Texas 2020, and there she was, what I still am. I can't tell you why I couldn't stop staring at that window, a kitchen window of all things. 
mercy, it was or wasn't a window. It was the shoebox my cousin kept her hand-fashioned dolls in, Bula Apu, what I called her, not her real name. It's the screen I slumped before to wade worn and wide emails. I didn't fall behind, but fell politely and discreetly apart. Dogwood, window, the wasps repurposing the arm of that plastic wicker chair into a home. The pair of mockingbirds alighting so near, I felt, I swear, on the inside, the gentleness of their feathers. Imagine an ordinary afternoon. Some harm had occurred. I hadn't noticed until after, i.e. lately, I was alive and staring. Recovery was a gentle and jagged reintroduction. Where had she been? I, I, along with her red flower dress I never wore again. I can see it so clearly still, the window my gaze made of the wars that went on, 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 all that thunder, a frequent stab of lighting. They returned eventually, my two minds, I mean, their limpid and lean logics. Mercy, mercy and time, window. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tarpia. Is that forthcoming in a in a publication or a collection, or is it still? Uh, it is. It is not. It is. It is just out and about. No, actually, okay. it's just. It's been just being here at home with me. So okay. we'll see where it ends up. Thank you so much. Our next uh, reader is uh, Hamid Ismailov, and our next book away is to Alexandra Bell in Bloomington, Illinois. So we will follow up uh, Alexandra and get your address to send you a copy of one of the books. So I'd like to introduce uh, Hamid Ismailov, who was born into a deeply religious uh, Uzbek family of Mullahs and Kojas living in Kyrgyzstan, many of whom had lost their lives during the Stalin era persecutions. Yet he received an exemplary Soviet education, graduating with distinction from both the secondary school and military college, as well as attaining university degrees in a number of disciplines. Though he could have become a high-flying Soviet or post-Soviet apparatchik, instead his fate led him to become a dissident writer and poet residing in the West. He was the BBC World Service's first writer in residence. Critics have compared his books to the best of the Russian classics, Sufi parables, and works of Western postmodernism. While his writing reflects all of these and many other strands, it is his unique intercultural experience that excites and draws the reader into his world. So the copy of the novel we're giving away is called The Devil's Dance, published by Twisted Axis Press, and his most recent book in English is called Menashe, and I believe that's the source of his uh, reading today. Welcome, Hamid. Thank you very much. Uh, very much honored uh, to be part of this uh, uh, wonderful festival. Uh, so you might ask what Manas means. Manas is the uh, longest uh, epic of humankind. Uh, some versions of it consist of two million uh, verses. So Manaschi or Manas tellers are like shamans or prophets. They usually mystically initiated to tell the story, but by Manas himself. And Manas is a legendary half divine, half humane hero. So the story starts, uh, a novel starts with Bikesh, a radio presenter who dreams that his uncle Baisal, a true Manaschi, initiated him. But the dream is confusing. Next day, uh, Bikesh receives a telegram that his uncle Baisal died in a mountainous village. So Bikesh inherits his uncle's eagle by the name of Tumor and a horse called Topan. The morning eagle doesn't accept anyone and Bikesh decides to cheat him. He puts on clothes and garments of his uh, uh, late uncle, a fur coat and a fur hat, and then enters the room where the eagle is kept. So the scene. We have to feed two more. Uncle Baisal had fed two more twice a day, but because the eagle had eaten almost nothing for two days since his death, 
and its crop was now empty, it was absolutely essential to attend to it again. Bikesh was about to resort to his former ploy and once again deliberately put, uh, put on by sell outer garments as he went back to see the bird in its room. Again, he wrapped himself up with the fur cup's ear flaps and the leather collar of the fur coat. Meanwhile, Dapan, his nephew, came and uh, cut a piece of meat weighing just under two pounds. And when it was ready, he passed it to, to Bikesh's gauntlet. This time, Bikesh didn't tremble inwardly as he entered and moving across from the door behind him, he stayed there while Dapan looked on, observing him through a crack in the door. On this occasion, the bird didn't fling itself from corner to corner in mad panic, but it still sat nervously on its perch, wary its, necks, uh, its neck feathers slightly ruffled. Meanwhile, Bikesh was observing it through the narrow gap between his ear flaps and the fur on his collar. Holding the meat with his gauntlet, he offered it to the bird. And very quietly, in, in, uh, imitating by Sal's voice, his words muffled, he said invitingly, Toom. Uh, for an instant, the bird seemed to be in two minds. It cried, e in a rather plaintive voice, then flapping both wings, it struck out at Bikesh's hand. It wings, its wings, or rather the gust of air blown by them, hit Bikesh's face, which was hidden in a fur. Bikesh felt as if uh, his hand has been struck by something weighing a hundred weight. Uh, his heart filled with pride, and he thought to himself, tomorrow, trust me now. Now the eagle uh, would readily pick at the, uh, at the meat and Bikesh could use his other hand to stroke and smooth its wings, speaking affectionate words into its ear. As if to put an end to these fancies, the eagle raised its long head and with a sudden step of its beak, plucked the fur hat off Bikesh's head and hurled it into the hay on the floor. After this, Bikesh's heart felt as uh, if, uh, if it had snapped he got down and feebly told himself, I'm a dead man. The eagle's blood filled red eyes fixed on Bikesh. Bikesh's jugular vein bulged and began to pulse. If the uh, enormous eagle sank its steel beak into that treacherous vein, it would all be over. Bikesh may have thought this, or the bird's bulging eyes may have suggested it. For some reason, he started saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. The bird raised its pitiless head once more, then with all the strength it could muster, plunged its murderous beak into a piece of meat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hami. Did you mention the name of your nominee? I'm not sure. And the name of my nominee is Jean-Pierre Balp, the creator of the computer poetry. So Peter about thank, okay wonderful and thank I you. am uh, I am now in London and yes thank you for joining us this evening from London especially that was lovely um, our next recipient of a book giveaway is Jennifer John from Albuquerque New Mexico so congratulations Jennifer and our next juror reading is Fauzia Karimi she is a writer and an illustrator. Her illuminated debut novel, Above Us, The Milky Way, was released in 2020. I'll, I'll just show it here, but it, it's among this entire stack of books, they're just incredibly beautiful uh, as, as books of, of um, as craft of, of workmanship and, and illustration and, and so many in so many ways, the cover uh, depictions as well. So I'm, and really just it's honor it's an honor to be able to give away copies of these books and and so this is a Fauzia's book published by Deep Bellum. She has illustrated Faust by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Susanna Osvath and Frederick Turner, The Brick House by Micheline Aronian Marcom, and Vagrants and Uncommon Visitors by A. Kendra Green. She is a recipient of the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. Please welcome Fauzia Karimi. Hi, thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege really to be here with you all. 
Um, my name is Fozia Karimi, and um, I have nominated Micheline Aharonian Markham uh, for the prize. Um, and I am in Denton, Texas, just north of Dallas. Um, so I'm going to be reading to you today from Above Us, The Milky Way, which is a um, novel based on my early childhood, on uh, my family's immigration from Afghanistan to Southern California, um, and mainly on the war uh, in Afghanistan, which, you know, it's something that regardless of where you are as an Afghan, it, it stays with you. It lives on because it has lived on all these decades. It continues to go on. Um, so the book is an abecedarium. Uh, the structure of it uh, is based around the alphabet. I'm going to read to you a piece from the very beginning of the novel. I'm going to read uh, the letter B. <clears throat> B, before all that happened and existed before the war and the land that birthed the seven of us. In the beginning, there was life, simple, then the war arrived. In an instant, much happened, and suddenly we found ourselves upon a new shore and looked about us at the sand, the waves, the bright star overhead. But what was there before in the first land in the beginning? Udnabut, there was, there was not. In the beginning, a family, a great and an ever-growing family composed of a matriarch, my grandmother, my mother's mother, the only grandparent living when I came into the world. Many aunts and uncles, mostly on my mother's side, and many, many cousins of all ages and heights, with myriad interests and manners, ensuring that we each had a friend of our own when we went visiting. And there was much visiting. There was much food and feasting, tea served endlessly. Sweets set out in great cascading wow. hills, pillows piled on cushions laid over limitless red rugs. There was a regular celebrating and commemoration of births and birthdays, circumcisions and graduations, holidays and anniversaries, of life great and small, of loss great and small. There were many stories, those told and those unfolding, bud na bud, much talk and sharing, gossip and soothsaying. There was laughter and joy and life spread and interweaved across an entire country. We had my mother's grand family in the city and my father's small family of simple farmers who lived in a village hundreds of miles in a winding mountain pass away. There was travel between the two and always adventure and play, wagon rides and tree swings, carrots tugged out of the ground, corn twisted off tall whispering stalks. Goats, chickens, cows, and dogs to feed, chase, and climb. A gurgling brook and the strawberries that grew on its banks. Hills covered with dwellings, dwellings bursting with life. Streets filled with the traffic of pedestrians, vendors, cars, buses, and bicycles. Connecting all were neighbors, grocers, barbers, midwives, tailors, each like kin. There were markets and movies, street peddlers and their singular calls accompanying a rainbow of balloons or mounds of blood red beets, which bobbed and peeked over the garden wall. There were rivers and picnics and bright colored soft curved automobiles that delivered us there. Parades and television shows, school and friends and painted pictures of sweet ripe watermelon or sailboats crossing bright blue seas. And then there was war. In an instant, much happened, and suddenly. And war on entering obliterated everything and all. War on entering the peaceful scene turned it upside down and inside out. It shattered, severed, distorted, erased, violated, obliterated life, great and small. Harmony, great and small. Feeling, great and small. Wonder, great and small. What was a flower to war, a child to war, a culture, a melody, a river, a picnic, a ritual, a statue, a farmer, a fairy tale, a people, a memory, a taxi driver to war. So the buildings and farmlands and mountain passes were bombed. So the people were disappeared, raped, tortured, dismembered, swallowed whole. So the children's senses became keener, the adults' minds numbed, their skin crawled. 
So the horror straddled and settled over the land. In the beginning, there was war. Before the war, there was family. There was life, simple. See how little patience I have for the orderly telling of things. Thank you. Thank you, Fazia. That was really wonderful. And I, I do hope everyone will get a chance to, to take a look at the, the beautiful illustrations and photographs that, that accompany your book. Um, Thank again, you. It's really delightful to have, to have you uh, with us today. So our next um, book winner is uh, Amy Olson from Frankfort, Kentucky. So congrat congratulations, Amy. And I will next introduce Eleni Kefala, a poet and academic from Cyprus. She is the author of Memory and Variations and Time Stitches, to, uh, two collections in Greek. She has been a finalist for the Diabaso, first time author award in Greece and winner of the State Prize for Poetry in Cyprus. Her poetry has appeared in many magazines and anthologies in, the, in Cyprus, Greece, Bulgaria, Italy, France, Turkey, and the United States, including in World Literature Today. Her book, Time Stitches, is forthcoming in English, translated by Peter Constantine from De uh, Deep Vellum next summer, so I don't have a copy to show you yet. Eleni was born in Athens, and grew up in Cyprus, studied in Nicosia and Cambridge, and currently makes her home in Scotland, where she teaches Latin American and comparative literature at the University of St. Andrews. Welcome Eleni and Peter Constantine, a special guest to be reading some translations as well. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, it's exciting to be um, here with you. Um, uh, I have nominated uh, the Greek poet and lyricist Michalis Ganas, and I'm joining you from Scotland as Daniel uh, suggested. I'm going to share my screen uh, with you. Let's hope that it works. Uh, it should. Yeah, it should be fine. Um, okay. Here we are, and let's, sorry, let's do this. Let's minimize the windows here. Perfect. Um, so Peter Constantine and I are going to read from the book, uh, poetry book, Time Stitches, um, which as Daniel has just said, um, is forthcoming in English in Peter's translation uh, this July uh, from Deep Vellum. The book was originally published in Greek uh, in 2013. Now, the uh, title uh, of the book in Greek is Chronographia, which is um, a newly coined term uh, meaning time stitching. It is an experimental book of linked poems, uh, a tapestry of motifs uh, that transcend time, space, and identity. As the poem threads draw together, uh, it is as if the protagonist, um, a young Cypriot who travels throughout uh, well, through the, the 20th century, uh, it's like as if he encounters Odysseus, Cervantes, Columbus, Moctezuma, Rembrandt, and many others um, on his way, all moving within a, a multidimensional synchronicity. As we leap from one uh, poem to another, meaning becomes fluid, uh, forcing us to rethink what we have just read. And in this way, of course, the readers um, are invited to, to participate, take part in the production of meaning uh, by stitching together their own uh, reading of the story. Ultimately, Time Stitches is a book about time, but also about the function of poetry. Uh, the first three poems um, Peter and I will read um, uh, they, ex they explore the role of poetry, while the, the final poem is a love song. So we'll start with the Greek. Ποιήση. Η ποιήση είναι μια πόρτα ανοιχτή. Μια πόρτα, μέσα θόρυβος. Την ανοίγει. Βλέπεις το ποίημα να ξυλώνει μία-μία τις λέξεις, τις φράσεις. Να απεκδίεται τις παρομοιώσεις, τους υπενιγμούς, τις μεταφορές. Μέχρι που ξεγυμνώνεται μπροστά σου και σου απλώνει το χέρι. Poetry. Poetry is an open door. A door, noise within. You open it, you see the poem unraveling, the words one by one, the phrases denuding, the similes, the illusions, the metaphors, until it is standing naked before you, reaching out his hand. Peace. Η peace δεν είναι παρηγορία. Δεν είναι τραγούδι τη χαρά και τη λύπη. Δεν είναι καταφύγιο στο στόμα ενό τυφλού. Δεν είναι μουσείο. Η ποιήση 
δεν είναι εγχειρίδιο νοημάτων στο ράφι με τα κλασικά. Ούτε ομορφιά που καραδοκεί σε ένα δωμάτιο με καθρέφτε και μισοκαμένα ξύλα. Η ποιήση δεν είναι θάλασσα, ούτε ναυάγιο, ούτε στεριά, ούτε χάρτη, ούτε πηξίδα. Η ποιήση είναι. Poetry. Poetry is not solace, it's not a song of joy and of sadness. It is not a haven in the mouth of a blind man. It is not a museum. Poetry is not an almanac of meanings on the shelf with the classics, nor is it beauty that looms in a room with mirrors and half burned logs. Poetry is not a sea, nor a shipwreck, nor a terra firma, nor a map, nor a compass. Poetry is. Ερώτηση. Πώς να δεχτείς πως η μοναξιά είναι η μόνη σταθερή αλήθεια που μας διέπει σήμερα είπαν στις ειδήσει πως ένας δράκοντας καταβρώχθησε έναν άνθρωπο πώς να πιστέψεις. Πως η μοναξιά είναι πώς να πιστέψεις. Πως η αλήθεια είναι πώς να δεχτείς. Πως η ποιήση είναι η μόνη μας ελπίδα. Question. How are you to accept that loneliness is the only steadfast truth that governs us today? I heard on the news that a dragon devoured a person. How are you to believe that loneliness is? How are you to believe that truth is? How are you to accept that poetry is our only hope? And I'm going to read the final poem uh, in English. Love song. I can give you my loneliness, my darkness, the hunger of my heart. I am trying to bribe you with uncertainty, with danger, with defeat. I give you the memory of a volcanic crater I beheld one evening in Nicaragua, of a sunset by the sea of an island of the south, of the tree in the yard that as a child I used to climb. I give you my first day at school, my first song, my first poem, my first book. I give you the glance of a person who falls in love, the embrace of a person who loves, the fear of a person who will die. I give you the despair of a person who knows that one day the volcano and the tree and the glance will be lost, the memories will be lost, the embrace and the poem will be lost. I give you the defeat of a person in the face of time and loss, the withering of the body, the loneliness of eternity. I give you the fear of a person who loves you, despite the fear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Eleni, and thank you, Peter. It really reminds me how much, how important translators are to the Neustadt Prize historically from Giuseppe Ungaretti in 1970 up until uh, Ismail Cadere last year. And Peter himself is a, a translator of Cadere's work as well as many other writers. And as Jennifer Croft is as well, um, these polyglot translators really help us bridge the, the many worlds of world literature and, and into English and give us a lingua franca to discuss these incredible writers. So thank you, Peter, again. Next winner of our book giveaway is Eva Grasso from Port Jefferson, New York. Congratulations. And I will introduce our next reader who has asked to uh, leave her camera off during her reading. R.O. Kwan's nationally best-selling first novel, The Incendiaries, published by Riverhead, is being translated into seven languages. Named a best book of the year by over 40 publications, the Incendiaries received the Housatonic Book Award and was a finalist or nominated for seven other prizes, including the National Book Critics Circle First Book Award. Kwan was named one of four writers to watch by the New York Times, and she has received awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, Yaddo, and McDowell. Kwan and Garth Greenwell co-edited co the nationally best-selling Kink, an anthology published by Simon & Schuster. Please welcome Aro Kwan. Hi everyone, thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to Newstat and to everyone who's here. Um, so I am recovering from a medical procedure, which is why I have my camera off. Um, and I'm hoping it'll be like hearing a short reading in the dark, uh, which is also one of my favorite ways of hearing a story. I hope it's one of yours. 
My nominee is the magnificent Natalie Diaz, um, and I'm in San Francisco. So I'm going to read um, the first chapter. It's a very short chapter from The Incendiaries. And it's a novel about a woman who gets involved with a group of extremist Christians, and the group turns out to be a cult. And they end up bombing abortion clinics, healthcare clinics, in the name of faith. Um, I used to smile when I said this to people I just met, you know, like people ask, what do you do when you say you're a writer and they say, what are you working on? And you tell them. Um, so I used to sort of like beam at people to try to not seem quite so weird. And a friend did me the great favor of saying, it's so much weirder that you smile. <laughs> so I started delivering that with a straight face, but either way, y'all can't see me. All right, so I'll read from the first chapter. Um, it's told from the point of view of Will, who is a man who loves Phoebe, who is a woman who becomes involved with the cult. One. They'd have gathered on a rooftop in Knoxhurst to watch the explosion. Platt Hall, I think, 11 floors up. I know his ego, and he'd have picked the tallest point he could. So often, I've imagined how they felt waiting. With six minutes left, the slant light of dusk reddened the high old spires of the college, the level gables of its surrounding town. They poured festive wine into big bellied glasses. Hands shaking, they laughed. She would sit apart from this reveling group, cross-legged on the roof's west ledge. Three minutes to go, two, one. The Phipps building fell. Smoke plumed the breath of God. Silence followed, then the group's shouts of triumph. Wine glasses clashed together, flashing martial light. He sang the first bars of a Cheja psalm. Others soon joined in. Carolyn bells chimed, distant birds blowing white, strewn like dandelion tufts, an outsized wish. It must have been then that John Mill came to her side. In his bare feet, he closed his arm around her shoulders. She flinched, looking up at him. I can imagine how he'd have tightened his hold, telling her she'd done well, though before long, it would be time to act again, to do a little more. But this is where I start having trouble, Phoebe. Buildings fell, people died. You once told me I hadn't even tried to understand. So here I am, trying. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aro. I really just want to take all 10 of these books and just read through them and devour them. Um, it's, they're just so fascinating to, to hear these uh, excerpts uh, being read. So thank you again to our jurors for sharing this work with us today. Okay, our next uh, copy of the book uh, giveaway goes to Stacy Wells in South Lake, Texas. Congratulations, Stacy. And our next reader from Brooklyn is Carlos Labe, who is the author of nine novels, most recently, Viaje a Patagua, Patagua? Patagua. His spiritual choreographies, La Cuela and Navidad and Matanza, are available in English translation. He has also published two short story collections, a book of essays, and scattered poems. He co-wrote the screenplays of two feature films, Malta con Huevo and El Nombre. Also a musician, Labe was part of the band's Ex Fiesta and Tornas Solidos, and has put out five solo albums in streaming services. With a master's degree in Latin American literature, Labe works as a copy editor and has been part of the publishing collective Sangria for 12 years. And I believe he's reading an excerpt from Spiritual choreographies today. Carlos, welcome. Of the short term, long term community. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn. My my nominee is Cristina Rivera Garza. And I'm gonna read from, from my novel, Spiritual Choreographies, published by Open Letter, translated by Will van der Hidden. And I wish I could be, uh, be reading also in, in Spanish, why not, uh, for you to 
it have a sense of decadence of this novel that is a bad um, that tends to be a family, a straight family, uh, a community, a community. This is a novel in plural about the future, about possible futures, and, and I'm going to read a, a page, page number 92, uh, an episode that the band is coming back from um, a big hiatus, and some had a Carlos, I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if no it's my Wi-Fi. If it's my Wi-Fi connection oh. that's unstable or yours. Um, I don't know if it would help to turn off your camera just while you're reading. Do you hear me now? Uh, that's better. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me try stopping the video. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'm gonna start again. The three of them had appeared on stage with only a wooden harp and a tube organ. No retina filling digital close-ups, no three tired orchestras or eco-political rants, no apocryphal verses or on-screen explosions. And then with a nod, with a nod of the vocalist's head, a grinding hydra hydraulic engine raised the neoclassical facade of what had been the municipal theater. So the concert was suddenly out in the open air and the 100 seats were immediately surrounded by hundreds of students, workers, the unemployed, assistants, advisors, protesters, grocers, new arrivals, dogs, and girls who had at that hour rummaged through the downstairs of the old neighborhood's high-end restaurants. The finance secretaries of the anti-empire took the moment to light up their water pipes because it was all starting to make sense. The prohibitive cost of the exclusive tickets for the band's only reunion concert had been used to rebuild the facade of the old municipal theater in such a way that minutes before the opening song, all the people in the street had congreg congregation there. That had been the only condition the percussionist, the vocalist, and the other had stipulated when the mentor's wife had proposed the reunion concert. And in effect, it allowed thousands of unanticipated attendees to all at once connect the band's multiform discography with the enigma of their first toccatas, with the ideological saturation of their recent productions, and with the battle royale that exploded in the park at that summer concert when their breakup had been deemed consummated. The effect was rage. The band made music out of rage. What rage? shouted a barefooted man. Just then in the sky, the roof opened now to an enormous hologram appeared, showing documentary footage of clashes between fans and police at the festival in the desert, at the exit to a classical music festival in the old Northern capital during the pre-dawn hours of a new year along a stretch of beach bordering the jungle and in front of the parking garage at Estadio Popular in counterpoint with the studio, with the audio of the shouting matches he, she, and the other had at those final press conferences. From his seat, a supreme judge of the first hemisphere coughed. Then a group of haute couture designers raised their glasses. These were the previously agreed on signals for a detachment of military bodyguards to encircle the faction of elites in a protective ring. The swelling chants of the masses interrupted by the helicopters could be heard over everything. The show hadn't even started. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. That was perfect with your, with your video off. I the audio was, was very clear for me, so I appreciate appreciate that. Okay. Um, Thank you. El Dr. Carlos, we are coming next to Carlos Pintado, and the book giveaway this time is to Luann O'Hare from Laverne, Oklahoma. 
Congrats, Luann. Carlos Pintado, up next, is a Cuban-American writer, playwright, and award-winning poet. His book, Habitación a Oscuras, received the prestigious Santo Ordiz International Prize for Poetry. And his book, El Azar y los Tesoros, was one of the finalists for Spain's Adonais Prize. In 2014, Carlos was awarded the Pass Prize for Poetry for his new book, Nine Coins, Nueve Monedas, given by the National Poetry Series, published by Akashic Books. His published books include Los Bosques de Mortefontán, Habitación a Oscuras, Los Nombres de la Noche, El Unicornio y Otros Poemas, Cuaderno, El Falso Amor Impuro, Davenschlag, and La Sed del Ultimo que Mira. Some of his works have been translated into English, Italian, German, French, Turkish, Por Portuguese, and Italian, and have appeared in the New York Times, American Poetry Review, World Literature Today, Latin American Literature Today, and Vogue, among others. Classical music groups like the San Francisco Chorus Continuum Ensemble and the South Beach Music Ensemble have performed his poetry. Please welcome Carlos Pintado. Hello, everyone. Um, first off, I just want to say I'm so grateful to the new stack committee, World Literature Today, Daniel, Michelle, everyone. And it makes it more happy, you know, it makes it happier just to know that I'm reading with some of the, you know, the judges that I really, really, really admire. So it's, it makes it, you know, really, really incredible. Um, my nominees is Reina Maria Rodriguez, uh, a, an incredible writer, um, which you all know and, and read and get to know her. And I'm going to read from Nine Coins. And this poem is called, I to am Ulrich. And Ulrich is a character from um, Robert Musil, The Men Without Attributes, the German novel. Without attributes, tempted to say without qualities, I am the dead man who gazes at death without recognizing it. Death, a circle small and dreadful, that burning circle flickering, almost unseen, revealing all at once, every face and everything I have loved passionately and transiently, or so it seems, without attributes, which is to say without grasping at salvation, without a love story triumphant at the end of days, without a light, to cross that shadowed room where the boy I was weeps and bleeds and begs and screams, don't leave me alone, don't leave me alone, don't leave me alone. And I, not knowing what to do, could not save him and go laughing into the gas chamber. That's right, I laugh, who will stop me? I who laugh in a gas chamber, no, you cannot do anything to me. You can do nothing. Understand that. I have, I have no throat to slit. My life is left behind. Far away, so far away, like those tiny figures drawing close so slowly in a landscape out of memory. I am my own incest. Didn't you know every act of love is a suicide? Come, put your fingers to my lips, strange gesture to silence words, mute gesture as, as we will swallow sweet poison. Why, why are you shocked at my laughter? It is a rabid shadow animal that walks beside where to leave it. I know I'm practicing my farewell. And escape. I give notice. I know what can you see. I thought all this was life. These floor, these forest clearings, these shard bodies, these lips I kiss with passion. This craze for twilight walks in a park. These children who go to slaughtered families, these are not life. What can you understand? 
with our attributes. Yes, it's true. At the mercy of all things like leaf. Who will go to these places of pain for me? Who will hold down his hands, bring them to his chest, turn his back, close his eyes, and think? Soon their fingers will pull the trigger, and I will open my eyes, my eyes to see how they have fired on me, not knowing what I will do next. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. That was a really incredible, uh, powerful poem. I should note that in our fall issue of World Literature Today, one of the cover featured essays is Carlos's uh, piece called The Cuban Maid's Tale, which reflects on the protests from summer of 2021. And this is a spotlight on translation issue, all translation from page one to page 112. And it's really worth checking out. So especially for Carlos's wonderful essay in the Peter Boss series. Next up, we will welcome uh, Matthew Shinoda, and I will mention the winner of the next book giveaway, and that is Emma Virian from Austin, Texas. Emma, congratulations, and welcoming Matthew Shinoda, who is a writer, professor, university administrator, and author and editor of several books. His debut collection of poems, Somewhere Else, was named one of 2005's debut books of the year by poets and writers and was winner of a 20, 2006 American Book Award. He is also the author of Seasons of Lotus, Seasons, Seasons of Bone, editor of Duppy Conqueror, New and Selected Poems by Kwame Dawes, and most recently author of Tarir Suite, a book of poems published by Northwestern University Press and Triquarterly Books, winner of the 2015 Arab American Book Award, and with Kwame Dawes, he is also editor of Bearden's Odyssey, Poets Respond to the Art of Romare Bearden. He's currently Associate Provost for Social Equity and Inclusion and Professor of Literary Arts and Studies at Rhode Island School of Design, where he directs the Center for Social Equity and Inclusion. Additionally, he is a founding editor of the African Poetry Book Fund. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you to all of my fellow jurors for those stunning readings. Um, my nominee is Kwame Dawes, and I'm presently near the shores of the Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. I'm going to read three poems from a forthcoming collection called The Way of the Earth. Fire. The hills here have always been a mercy, a procession of relief stretching into an untenable sun. Chaparral cut by the dusted stamp of a rabbit's foot everything alive in the saline air. We live at once in the, silhouette, in the silhouette of such things, even when blinded. We are always in the shadow of something. Embers of fire, the black pinions floating towards earth. When the fires struck, we watched the miles stretch across the Pacific, knowing that the hard earth could call for rain that the sky could root itself like an ancient umbilical, unseen lightning, the twin of a new beginning. When the earth spoke black, we knew a new day was coming. We knew we would not be devoured until our time had come. When I was young, we had an olive tree in the yard, a blanket beneath its branches. We would shake the trunk until the sky rained black, savor the salted pluck, and seed the earth with our spent desires. Midday sun. Idling at the port, faded green like the metallic back of an insect bathed in light. A slow rumble laden with pots and nets, the bow facing west, pushing for the far horizon. We decorate our homes with words, return the burden of our forgetting like the bobbing head of a shorebird, the rolling line of a swell moving to the jagged edge of a deep sea baseline. Visceral is the moment of memory, the way I moved like a creature, wings tucked in, floating up the coast of my childhood. Weak after week, I returned to see my dying father, his final days in the geography of my childhood, so far from his own. 
The hills painted with the shadows of walks we long took before time moved us across the palimpsest of memory, before returning, before the compass grew roots. The last time he pulled me close with his words, he told me of the future I would live breathed into me the way someone breathed into him, the way the fishing net and that not too distant sea linked one loop to another, each held by the strength of the one before it. The edge is the end of the beginning for Minrit one. I have come from the virtue of the mountaintop, the lamp wick, not the light. Descending down the switchback scent of dampness and tree bark, pine needles scattered at my feet like sand parted by weight. When I round the corner to the next vista full of mist and light, I will find an understanding wrapped in the haze of a calling ocean, the witness of its own future, a slow crumbling home. And when this ridge finally arrives at the edge of the shore, my footsteps with it, all the impermeable weight that bears down from my head to my heels will float like a sun at the edge of the world and find its way to the ocean's bottom, drifting perhaps to the place where once these sensations took root. Two, I am the father of four children, three of them living. It is a simple mathematics, one plus one minus one plus two. I have touched loss and I have touched grief, but not at the hands of another. I do not pretend all things are equal. Three, washed ashore each bulb of kelp and orb of possibility fragile in the hands of a man but able to travel distances none could imagine sustaining from the tendons and muscles of their bodies. Loss is a thing we often attribute to the heart, but what of the floating loss of salt and kelp, adrift, made material in the gelatinous space of sea and earth, floating like the silent breath of a child unreturned to this earth floating like the spirit of a child, made manifest beyond our tangible understanding. Four, she is not like the journey of a river to sea, nor like the way a redwood punctures heaven. She is something else, something not unspeakable, but unknown in this form, a thing once held no longer, as I stand on this edge, the end of the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I can't wait to get a copy of, of your book, but The Way of the Earth. Where is it uh, forthcoming from and when, when will, will it be out? Northwestern sometime in the next year, two years, who knows? Not sure on the pub date. But okay, yeah, Northwestern again. Wonderful Way of the Earth. I'll be sure to look forward to, to seeing that. Thank you again. Okay, our last regular book giveaway goes to Kara Stewart from Timberlake, North Carolina. So congratulations, Kara. And um, we'll get that book out to you as soon as we get your address. And our last juror reading uh, is by Olga Zilberborg, who is joining us uh, today from the West Coast. Her English language debut, Like Water and Other Stories, explores bicultural identity hilariously, poignantly, according to the Moscow Times. Her fiction and essays have appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review, Fair Life Review, The Believer, Confrontation, Electric, Electric, Electric Lit, Lit Hub, World Literature Today and elsewhere. Born in Leningrad, USSR, she grew up in St. Petersburg, Russia and makes her home in San Francisco. She has published three Russian language collections of stories, the latest of which, The Clapping Land, appeared in 2016 for Moscow-based Veremia Press. She serves as a consulting editor, editor at Narrative Magazine and as a co-facilitator of the San Francisco Writers' Workshop. Together with Yelena Furman, she co-founded Punctured Lines, a feminist blog about literature from the former Soviet Union. Welcome, Olga. Thank you so much um, for um, this amazing event, and I'm so honored to, to be a part of this. 
Um, I'm going to read a, um, so in my book there, it's, there are 52 very short stories. Uh, some, some of them are very short and some of them are more standard length. So that there's actually a bit of range, but I'm gonna read one of the, um, the shorter ones. And it's, uh, it's inspired um, in part by something that happened to my mom in Russia and uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign and its failure. Um, so the story is called Moving Forward. Look left, look right. But the most important rule about crossing the street was to keep moving forward. Clara's husband had insisted on repeating this to the kids and then to the grandkids nearly every time they walked somewhere together. Say a car charges at you. Be brave, move ahead, do not run, do not stop, do not turn back, do not alter your pace. It's best to keep steady, walking not too fast, not too slow. Scared pedestrians make drivers nervous. Then accidents happen. Courage is strength you can count on. Clara's husband had been a chief engineer at a factory that built tanks. He was a big guy, himself built like a tank. To her, he was an authority when it came to the mechanics of moving heavy complex bodies through space. The kids never listened. Her daughter insisted on running across the street. Her son, on the other hand, had a habit of stopping in the middle of the intersection, freezing before the charge of oncoming traffic. It was luck that neither had been killed. Her kids were so, her, her grandkids were so bad that once they grew out of their strollers, she preferred not to walk with them. Clara, was the only one who had really taken her husband's lesson to heart. She always crossed the street circumspectly, determined to stay the course. Even as her pace slowed with age, she kept moving forward. Then one day, a car hit her. She landed near the sidewalk, breaking her fall on a pile of snow. Clara stayed there a moment, she may have hurt her arm, but she was otherwise fine. The driver, a bald man about her age, rolled down the passenger side window and leaned across the seat shouting, what are you doing? Bah! With that purse and that hair, I thought you were a babe. Grandma, if you can't cross the street on your own two feet, use a wheelchair, stay home, you are done. It was true. Clara had recently colored her hair and shed about 20 years from her passported age. The man drove away slowly. She got up from the snow. Clara's husband had recently died from a heart attack. She missed him. She wanted to tell him that he had been wrong. For one thing, he, she wasn't a tank. And I just want to add that, uh, so I've nominated the work of uh, Ludmila Petrushevska, an iconic uh, Soviet and post-Soviet Russian language writer for this prize. And I've been spending a lot of time with her work uh, recently. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that this, if, this, if this had been Petrushevska's story, Clara, my, the, the, my grandma, grandmother character, would would either pick a knife from her purse and, and or or a gun and shoot the attacker or possibly she would actually turn into a tank. Um, in any case, Petrushevska would definitely not leave her on the side of the road nursing her wounds, uh, as I have done here. So that's yeah. I, I hope you'll enjoy this book. Uh, this, uh, you know, they're unforgettable stories. Thank. You. Thank you so much, Olga. Um, seeing and hearing you read reminds me that um, so many of the jurors for the Newstat Prize over the years have gone on to win a Nobel. So um, as, a, as, as was the case this year with um, Abdul Razak uh, Gruna, he was a juror back in the early uh, 2000s. And so now he's been recognized with the, with the ultimate 
literary prize, but um, who knows, we may have among us uh, a future Nobel, future Nobel winner uh, this afternoon. I do have one uh, question that came up in the chat, which is for uh, Carlos Pintado, and it comes from Nancy Barcelo, and she wonders, um, Carlos, how did you come to write that incredible poem? Could you tell oh. us a little bit about it? Oh, oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, to be honest, I guess it comes from first a lot of suffering and then trying to connect with something that I, that I read in Bravo Musil's you know, novel, which is a man who's trying to find some sense of life and, and, and reality and, and trying to cope with himself. So um, I wasn't trying to get like, like a really dark, dark poem. So I'm, I'm trying to be as happy as I can sometimes. That's what poetry does, you know, it, it embraces and, and you write about a dark moment. So I was just trying to find a connection, you know, trying to, to, to find a meaning to that. And I, I'm going to say that half of, half, of, half of the poem, it's about myself trying to connect with Robert, Robert Musil's, you know, main character, Ulrich. I don't know if anybody speaks German, but... I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it well, Ulrich or Ulrich. So, and, and I guess it's about, you know, despair and, and, and me losing a lot of things that, um, as, a, as, a, as a human being and, and trying to regain it as a poet that I wrote the poem. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that question, Nancy. I, I don't see any other in the chat, any others in the chat at the moment, but if you do have a question, please uh, feel free to post it and uh, we'll try to answer it. We'll probably, we'll be wrapping up here in a, in a few minutes. I, I thought I would um, announce a, a quick uh, 11th book giveaway and it's gonna be based on a trivia contest. So this is um, the anthology for the first 50 years of the new that prize called uh, Dispatches from a Republic of Letters that Deep Vellum published last year and that I edited and we will give away a, a signed copy of this book, but you have to answer my qu question in the chat. So get ready to type it as quickly as possible and, and it will go to the first person who responds. And the question is, which finalist for the 2022 Newstat Prize won a 2021 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry and was a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award for Poetry for her latest verse collection. So if you can answer, whoa, <laughs> okay, that was quick. Uh, Catherine Young, congrats, congratulations. Nat Natalie Diaz, of course. And so I will, you will message me with your email in a, a private message. We will get your address and um, and send that out to you um, later this week. So, of course, Nelly Diaz, her book is called Postcolonial Love Poem, and she is one of the top, one of the 10 finalists for this year's New Stat Prize. Or, yes, question in the chat to any of the jurors what were you looking for in your nominations for the New Stat Prize? Andy Tepper is posing that question from Brooklyn. Thanks, Andy. Anyone? <laughs> Would anyone like to uh, tackle that question among the jury? I'll, I'll jump in. I think I was looking, it was a hard decision, by the way. I, at least for me, there were many, many contenders, but I, I was looking for someone with a significant body of work that I felt was under-recognized, both locally and nationally and internationally. Yeah, that's an interesting um, kind of positioning statement. It, it's, it's, it's often the case that the New Stat Prize recognizes a writer who, who, de who deserves that broader recognition but hasn't quite received it. Um, so I think that was the case with Adam Zagievsky uh, several many years ago and you know when we've had um, even more, you know, prominent names, 
nominated in the same year, uh, often the jury will choose to put a writer on the map that they think uh, deserves that recognition. So it's always interesting to uh, to uh, see that that deliberation play out just in the in the nominations themselves, and then in the uh, the conversation that the jurors have amongst themselves, and then ultimately in the voting. Any other responses to that question, Andy's question? Okay. I, I, would say, I would say literary merit and originality, obviously. <laughs> so not just literary merit, but um, I've been looking for someone who, um, who whose writing is at once idiosyncratic and original. Uh, and as Matthew has just said, that uh, perhaps they haven't received uh, um, due recognition yet, at least at, at an international level. Yeah, and, and the language of the charter is fairly simple. It, it, it's a question of literary merit according to the nominating guidelines. So, um, you know, that, that question of merit can be interpreted uh, in different ways. So we leave it up to the jurors to make that uh, decision as to how they would like to present their, their finalist. Any other responses to that question? It's a great question, Andy. Thanks again. Okay. Um, well, perhaps it's time, unless anyone else wants to chime in, to announce the winners of our viewers' poll. And if I can get a virtual drum roll here in third place is the nominee of Carlos Pintado. Reina Maria Rodriguez, the Cuban poet. In second place in the poll is the nominee of Tarfia Faizula, Naomi Shihab Nye, the Palestinian American writer who also happens to be a past laureate of the NSK Prize for Children's Literature, as well as a past juror, as uh, uh, is kind of the tradition of the NSK, which is uh, quite wonderful in that, re in that regard. And coming in first place among our viewers is Olga Silverberg's nominee, Ludmila Petrushevskaya. So she topped our poll uh, by a fair margin, and so it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out tomorrow. Of course, we will hear the decision of the jury at 7 p.m. Central Time tomorrow evening. Kathy Neustadt will join us to announce the winner uh, of the uh, the final tally of the voting. So tomorrow the jury will be convening to, to make that difficult decision. So we shall see how that all plays out. But that's all for now. I think that I have, uh, Carrie, would you like to, um, well, actually, well, I do have one more thing. I just wanted to, uh, I know you'll thank our sponsors, but I wanted to especially thank the Norman Arts Council and OU's College of International Studies and the Neustadt family. Of course, um, we do have Kathy and Nancy, I believe, here with us uh, this evening as representatives of the family. So uh, please stay tuned for tomorrow's announcement. And Carrie, I pitch it to you. Yeah, so my big announcement, of course, is be sure to come back tomorrow to hear who our winner is. Um, and then following that um, will be a conversation with um, Cynthia Lydic smith the NSK Prize uh, for Children's Literature winner from last year. Um, and then again, just a reminder to check out the book list on the event website, and we will see you all back tomorrow. Have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, writers, jurors. Good pleasure. Bye-bye.